It says, Elder Hiram Edson and others who were keen and noble and true were among those who, after the passing of the time in what year? Talk to me, somebody. That was after October 22nd. They searched for the truth as for what? Hidden treasure. I met with them. The prophet was there. Now, the prophet didn't understand everything that was happening. It wasn't until all the foundation of our faith had been laid from the scripture that God opened up her mind. I remember my teacher before he passed to the grave, Elder Mason, teaching me this step by step, and it made me enjoy when we studied hour after hour. I said, Lord, we're following in the footsteps of our pioneers. But we don't understand it anymore. It says, I met with them and we studied, and what else? Talk to me. And prayed. How? How? Earnestly. What's the next word? Now, what does often mean? Every once in a while, this was something common. It says, often we remain together until 9 o'clock. And then we pop up and all go home. Is that what it said? See, I'm talking about the pioneers. Do you think that we can do less than they did and finish the work? We don't understand our movement, brothers and sisters. It says, often we met together until late at night and sometimes through the entire night. Praying for light and studying the word of God. Now, that's amazing. Man, today, he will stay up through the entire night watching Netflix. The child and the parent together. They're not sleeping. Eyes wide open. What's the next one going in? What's the next one going in? Video games. Facebook. Snapchat. Everything. Watch it. Hour, hour, hour. And then all of a sudden, we come to the word of God and we start getting out holy and healthy. Well, it's 9 o'clock. I think I better go to sleep now. You know you're not going to sleep at 9 o'clock at your house. My brothers and my sisters, if we understood how close we were to the coming of the Lord, every one of us would wake up and stay up all night praying and studying. And this is why I'm in no way reluctant, no way apologetic. When we study the word of God hour after hour, my brothers and sisters, this is a special holy convocation now does everybody have to do it did everybody do it with them yes or no but i refuse to put handcuffs on me i would rather not be at a camp meeting if that be the situation i would rather study and pray and understand what thus said the lord or maybe you can do it with someone else amen now my brothers and my sisters this says often we remain together until late at night and sometimes through the entire night praying for light and studying the word of god again and what else again it says these brethren came together to study the bible in order that they might know its meaning and be prepared to teach it with power it says when they came to the point in their study where they said, we can do nothing more, the spirit of the Lord will come upon me and I will be taken off in vision and a clear explanation of the passage that we have been studying will be given. Then the prophet began to give instruction of how to teach it and labor effectively. What a movement, brothers and sisters. Let me ask you a question. Everything that prophet said, the Bible said, am I right? She says, often they were studying to how long? Midnight. Now, don't get afraid. I'm not going to keep you to midnight. <laughs> But it's often they were studying to what? I want to ask you a question. Is that biblical? Now, what are we studying? Making a what? I wonder if they made the Exodus at 8 o'clock in, in, in the evening. I wonder what time they made the Exodus. You know what the Bible says? Midnight. It was at midnight when they made the Exodus. What would have happened if they say, you know what? We're going to go to sleep tonight at 8 o'clock and just let God move over and pass through. You know they would never have made the exodus. Never have made the exodus. And there are going to be many families that will never make the exodus because we put worldly things and our own things where we can do it for ourselves but not for God. And it's not our children's fault. We should teach them to enjoy it as much as they can so that it's not a burden. If you, if you really love this and your children love it, it becomes a joy just like the world. And if they fall asleep, should they be condemned? Yes or no? No. Was there in the New Testament the Apostle Paul preaching in the evening and then he preached into, the, into midnight. Was there a time? Yes or no? The Bible actually says this, this same thing. Old and New Testament, same point. Was there a child that fell asleep? And now, now if he had fell asleep in the daytime, the Apostle Paul might have woke him up. But when he fell asleep at nighttime, the Apostle Paul didn't wake him up. He just kept preaching under the Spirit of God. And when he rested, they rested. But then one of the children fell down and died. Am I right? 
What did the apostle go and do? Talk to me. He went over and resurrected him. There's power in following the instruction of Jesus Christ. Now, my brothers and sisters, if we understand how close we are to the coming of the Lord, do you know that not one person, when the Son of the Lord has passed, is going to plead that and say, you know what, I wish that, that, that I continue to go to sleep and I never study. You know that everyone will say, Lord, I wish that I'd stayed up all night praying, studying, getting ready. But I'm so thankful that God's mercy is with us tonight, that we can open up the word of God and let Jesus speak to us. You see, my brothers and sisters, the real issue is not that. The real issue is this. Jesus is in the most holy place right now. And guess what? Jesus wants to come out. That's the issue. Do you want to bring Jesus from the most holy place? Yes or no? On October 22nd, 1844, Jesus went in. It's 20, 000, uh, 2002, uh, 22, and Jesus has still not come out. How long is that? 177. Someone said, well, no, it's 178. It, it truly, the number would be, but we haven't got to the fall of this year yet. In the fall of this year, it will be 178 years that Jesus has been inside the most holy place. Is he about to come out? Are you guessing? We should know of a, a surety from the word of God what is about to take place. Inspiration tells us that this is indeed the real issue, my brothers and sisters. If Jesus leaves the most holy place, what's the last two words? It's not just if he leaves the most holy place. He has to leave it. Guess what? You know, if a person's playing basketball and, and, and he, he's down by one. And he's getting ready to shoot the ball. If he shoots the ball and the clock runs out, but it's still touching his hand. And the clock runs out. He's down by one. The clock runs out. It's still touching his hand. And he lets it go. And the shot goes in. Do they win the game? No, they do not. It has to be done before the clock, what, runs out. And there's a clock in the great controversy. It's called the great clock of time. And it is running right now. The moment sent into the world, that clock has been running. And Jesus has to do it and finish the work on. He was always aware of this from the first to the second coming. He said, I, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. Why? For the night cometh when what? No man can work. He had a spirit of urgency about him. My brothers and sisters, this is the work of the third angel. It says God's purpose in giving the third angel's message to the world is to prepare a people to do what? Talk to me, somebody. Stand true to him during the investigative judgment. This is the purpose for which we establish and maintain our what, everybody? Public house. What else? Schools. What else? Sanitariums. What else? Housing restaurants. What else? Treatment rooms. And what else? Now, you know, almost every one of these we do not have anymore. Someone says, oh, yes, but look, we have schools. But are they on God's blueprint? Someone says, but we have hospitals. But is that God's plan? That's not a sanitarium. My brothers and sisters, it says these treatment rooms. Hygienic. You know, we don't even. Someone said, well, I went to a, a restaurant and it was a, a vegetarian. That's not a hygienic restaurant. There's a difference. Maybe tomorrow night we'll talk about some of these uh, uh, details. But it says, uh, and food factories, this is our purpose in carrying forward how much? Every line of working across. What is the purpose? To prepare a people to stand true to him during the investigative judgment when it passes from the dead to the... Do you know that Jesus cannot leave the most holy place until he gets somebody ready for the judgment of the living? And do you know that we will never be ready for the judgment of the living while sin is still in our lives? God must get a sinless generation in this final generation. And you and I can't make ourselves sinless. We need Jesus, the Lamb of God. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is why the devil in the Alpha and the Omega of apostasy tried to destroy all of these institutions. And today he has almost complete control of our entire denomination. And if I only had man's eyes, I would say the devil was going to win. But when you look at the eye of faith and you read the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, you're going to see that God is going to upset the devil. You ever seen a team that was down in the first quarter, the second quarter, and third quarter, but in that fourth, fourth quarter, they do something to take over the game. Jesus is about to put some team on the floor that's going to take over the game and finish the work. I want to be a part of that team. But it's not going to be the majority. It's going to be a remnant. 
a remnant of youth, a remnant of adults, a remnant of families. I want to be among them. What do you say? Now, my brethren, says it means that we're going to have to do what they did. They studied late. They prayed. They studied, not just in here, but in, when they're home, they're, they're praying and studying. They're saying, Lord, whatever it takes, get sin out of my life. You know, it took time to get sin in. It's going to take time to get sin out. How is it that we have spent hours with the devil on television, hours with the devil on cell phones, hours and all these things of the world, and then expect Jesus to fix us so quickly? The problem is not that he doesn't have power to do it. Do you know that God could do it instantly if we did not have a will? See, when he said, let there be light and there was light, that's because inanimate, inanimate nature always yielded to the word of God. What makes it take so long to us is that God speaks and God doesn't force us, but he causes us to have the opportunity to yield. And if we don't yield, the power of the word of God will not bear fruit in our lives. I want to learn to yield to Jesus. What do you say? Now, my brothers and sisters, in order for Jesus to come out of the most holy place, something must happen among the congregation. Am I right? The gospel must go to all the world in one generation. Do you know that right now we have over 7 billion people, over 80 million being born every year? Do you know we have never would reach the entire world in the way we're moving right now? Do you know it's going to take the power of the latter rain? This is why we're symbol saying, Lord, give us this. But that message going to the world would mean nothing unless God could produce a people that can live in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor, without a mediator, and not sin. They would rather die than sin because they love Jesus so much. They have become his friend. I want to be the friend of Jesus. What do you say? And so my brothers and sisters, tonight as we get ready to go deeper into the study, inspiration says Jesus Volume 5, 207, the chapter on the seal of God. It says, Jesus is about to leave the what? Mercy seat of the heavenly sanctuary. And, and look what it says. Because sinners against the evil work is not speed executed, therefore the heart of the sons of men are fully set in them to do evil. Instead of being softened by the patience and long forbearance that the Lord has exercised toward them, those who fear not God and love not the truth strengthen their hearts in their what? You know, if, if God were to give us a, a, a little bit more than 2025, 20, you know what someone would say? I told you you were wrong. You know what they would say? That's what they would say. But God said plus or what? But if God were to give us a little plus, a work of divine miracle, do you know that we should be able to say thank God? Not only for us, but that we can help somebody else. We cannot think selfishly. But my brothers and sisters, instead of it softening our hearts, it makes us say, oh, see, nothing happened. But there are, what's that next word? Limits. Did we see that from the Bible last night, yes or no? There are limits even to the forbearance of God. Therefore, God must interfere and vindicate his own honor. I wonder what these limits are. Look what it says. Limits. Jesus is about to leave the most holy place. When the limit is reached, Jesus leaves the most holy place. Of the Amorites, this is the very next paragraph, same chapter, very next paragraph. Of the Amorites, the Lord said, in the fourth generation, in the what? In the fourth generation, they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet what? Now, why would God bring that text in? The paragraph after talking about Jesus about to leave the most holy place. Does anybody know how a paragraph works? You know how a paragraph works? In, in English, I didn't learn many things, but I learned this. You group Sentences together in paragraphs that have the same thought. Am I right? Now, my brethren, says that means that there's something about Jesus leaving the most holy place and the fourth what? Generation. It says, the people were to see the divine power manifested in a marked manner that they might be left without excuse. The compassionate creator, is God compassionate? Was willing to bear with their iniquity, not forever, there's a limit. Until how long? Talk to me, somebody. The fourth generation, then, if no change was seen for the better, his judgments were to what? Fall upon them. Now, my brothers and sisters, this tells me that the limits are in the what generation? Now, in the most holy place, there is a mercy seat. Am I right? What's beneath the mercy seat? The law of God. What does the law of God do? What is the law of God? It is a transcript of his and what is the character of God? It tells us what God is like. It shows us what God is like. Inside of those Ten Commandments, near the bosom, 
it makes a statement of what God is like. It says that he has mercy on so many thousands and so forth. But then it says, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children until the third and fourth generation. Character of God. Fourth generation. Now, my brothers and sisters, when would the generation start in order to get the fourth generation if Jesus is about to leave the most holy place? It would start when Jesus went into the what? Well, when did Jesus go into the most holy place? He went in the most holy place. What year? Talk to me, somebody. Now, I'm not going to talk about this. I, I pray somehow that the Holy Spirit anoints Elder Marcus to talk about this somehow, somewhere, and some point in it. I'm not going here tonight. Somehow, <laughs> but somehow, my brother and sister, it says that in the fourth generation. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Wouldn't it be interesting if the fourth generation took us to 2025 plus or minus? I'm just going to tell you it does. Now, I'm going to leave the burden, and that, that, that's what the general used to do to me. <laughs> we would be preaching somewhere, and, and Brother Mason would say, point, say but, 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 but Brother Davis, he will finish it. <laughs> and I'm praying like, dear God. <laughs> so I know, I know what that feels like. <laughs> but somewhere in there, God's going to help us. Now, my brother and sister, listen. In the, in, in the fourth generation, now, you understand something. Listen, listen. Do you understand that if the general conference had met in 2020, the fourth generation would have already been installed. But what did God do? No general conference. 2021. No general conference. Now, I made a statement uh, some months ago, and I, uh, a year ago or so, and I said, when we start seeing the general conference start again, just know that the fourth generation is getting ready to be installed. And our time is over. No general conference. Why did God allow the pandemic at such a time? Do you know that never in the history of our work have we seen the general conference ever get suspended for two years? Never. It should have woke up every seven minutes to say, wait a minute. This is not normal. God stopped it. Push pause so that every seven minutes could wake up and say, this is it. It has never happened in any other generation from 1844. Why is it happening now? Because this generation shall not pass until everything be fulfilled. And guess what? 2022 this year, guess what happened? And you will see that at the beginning of the fourth generation began to be installed little by little. So it doesn't happen all at once. Little by little, I'm telling you, this is it. Right now, we should be praying, dear God, help me. Help my family. Wake us up. We should be praying for the church. We shouldn't be fighting the church and, and, and condemning the church. We should be saying, Lord, spare thy people, weeping between the porch and the altar, praying, Father, revival, reformation. We're going to stop right here and we're going to get into the word of God. We need to study. Do you want to study, yes or no? I was going to read the text, but you know the text. <laughs> Exodus 12 said, that the Passover happened at midnight. I wonder if you're willing to wait until midnight with Jesus in order to make the exodus. You know, any man that's not willing to wait until midnight to make the exodus, he might as well go to sleep. And I would pray, dear God, if I'm not willing, make me willing. Can God make us willing? Let's come together and let's talk to the Lord. And let's ask him, Lord, help us, because all of us need Jesus. Heavenly Father, I know that you're here. And I thank you, Father. I would rather you be here and no soul be here than to have everyone here and Jesus not be here. Father, I plead with you. Remove me. I'm weak, I'm feeble, I'm frail. But Lord, you want to speak to us. You want to speak to me. And I plead, Lord, that you would open up our eyes and our ears and our hearts so that our hearts will be melted by the love and truth of Jesus so that we will want to yield and become your close, intimate, and personal friend. 
Father, I plead that you would beat back the devil, that you allow angels to massage our brains and minds. We've had a long week because this is not normal, but Lord, you want us to study and to strain and to strain every nerve and muscle. We do it for Satan. Lord, help us to do it for you. I plead with you, Lord, tonight that you will give us a greater Sabbath portion. We're told in Desire of Ages 207 that you want to do more on this day than on any other. And when we ask something, you will not let the sun set without honoring and answering that request. My request is simple, Lord. Give us Jesus. Give us the Holy Spirit that our lives will never be the same. Change our inmost soul. Put enmity in our hearts that we may hate sin and love you with all of our hearts, dear God. I pray that you will bind the devil from this room. I pray that you will do something tonight that will make hell tremble. But will make Jesus happy. We want to please you, dear God. Abide with us now as we open your word. Let there be no careless soul, no inattentive ear. For we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll take your Bibles and turn to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3. What book did I say? We're going to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We want to notice what the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And when you get there, if you'll just let me know by saying amen. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now listen to me very carefully. Never before. Never before. In the history of our world. Have we lived in a time. As solemn and significant as we are in. In this final generation. Never has there been a generation as solemn. As the generation we're now in. My friends, we're living in a time when inspiration tells us that a great crisis is getting ready to overtake this church. And even in the few sessions that we have studied together, we have seen clearly from the Bible with prophetic clarity that time cannot continue much longer. Have we seen that? Yes or no? We have seen, brothers and sisters, that the handwriting is on the wall. The handwriting that proves that this is not the first generation, but that this is the last generation. A handwriting that proves that we're living in the final hours of earth's history. A handwriting that proves that we're on the verge of a great and stupendous crisis. And the majority of the world have no idea. But guess what? Even us as the people of God, not one of us is ready for what's about to take place. And do you know, brothers and sisters, someone says, well, I think I'm ready. No, 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 no. If we think we're ready, it proves we're unready. Do you know that even Jesus... Before Gethsemane was not saying, Lord, I'm ready, Lord, I'm ready. He's pleading, if it be possible, Father, let this cup pass from me. You don't see a man running saying, look how ready I am. The only one who did that was Peter and the other disciples. He said, Lord, I am ready. He showed he was unready. My friends, if we think we're ready, it proves we're unready. If we know we're unready, then it knows that we need to get ready. Is that true? Do you know that all of us are in this condition? We as adults, we're not ready for this. We as parents, families, we're not ready. Children, listen, young people, we are not, not one of us. And we do our children a disservice when we do not share with them the beauty of Christ and the love of God day in and day out. We make them not see the beauty of Jesus. Do you know that many children in the judgment we read in the book, early writings are going to rise up against their parents and say, if you knew this, why did you not tell me and train me like this? My brother and sister, can you imagine a child loving you now, but then turning on you at the very end saying, if, uh, if you had taught me this, I could have been saved. They're going to do it to their ministers. They're going to do it to leaders. They're going to do it to parents. Parents looking at children saying, if you were not so disobedient, I could have been saved. But you provoked me to anger instead of lovingly together saying, we are all in trouble. Let's go to Jesus. My brothers and sisters, we must understand something. Tonight, the Bible says that we are living in the most solemn time of this earth's history. We don't have much time. If ever there was a time to make an exodus and to set our house in order is now not talk about the exodus. There's a difference between talking about exodus and actually getting up and leaving some things behind. Getting up and saying, Lord, we're going to pray and study just like we did it for the world more for Jesus, giving him our time and our energy, everything for God. I know what I was like in the world. When I was in the world, I could spend hours doing everything. I didn't even care about nothing else. What would it be 
if we see Jesus. My brothers and sisters, we don't have much time left. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Look at what the Bible says beginning in verse 1. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Verse 1, the Bible says altogether, it says this, know also that in what days, everybody? In the last days, perilous or dangerous times, what's the last two words, shall come. Now, my brothers and sisters, you know there are those today in 2022 that say, I wonder when these days are coming. How can we wonder if we're living in the last days? I remember reading just the other day of a father. Had a son. Notice what I said. Had a son. Father upset simply takes the gun out, shoots his son in the head. Read of stories where grandsons upset with grandmothers. Now, it used to be an affection between a grand um, a parent and a child. Not today. No respect for authority. No respect for parent. No respect whatsoever because this is what we have been demonstrating. And as a result, it's not being taught. Now, my brothers and sisters, the grandchild gets up, son, upset his grandmother, try to correct him, goes into his grandmother's room, takes out a, 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 a semi-automatic weapon and blows her brains out. What is happening to our generation? The Bible says in the last days, the love of many shall do what? Wax cold. And yet there's still people wondering, are we living in the last days? How can I wonder when a young girl was outside in front of her own house playing, talking to her friends, and another young girl comes up. And when that young girl comes up, she saw uh, 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 she had a handgun in her hand, maybe one of those 45s, and took it in execution style, shot the girl, and her blood oozes out, and she dies on, in the front of her front door. How can we wonder if we're living in the last days? My brother and sister, the Bible says in the last days, the love of many shall wax cold. It says that perilous times shall come. But listen, perilous times are not coming. Perilous times are what? They're already here. We saw evidence after evidence telling us and teaching us of the days that are just before us. Now, my brothers and sisters, I want you to understand what we were doing last night. Did we prove last night that we're approaching a crisis? Yes or no? When did we see biblically the crisis was coming? We saw from 2025. What? Talk to me. Now, you got to add that plus or minus. Because God does not give us definite time. Am I right? After 1844, is it because there is no definite time? No, there's a definite time. There is a definite time and God knows it. But God is not going to tell us until after the close of probation. And he's going to tell us the definite time. There is a definite time. He knows it. But he has not told us. Now, my brothers and sisters, notice what this is trying to bring out to us. You see, something is getting ready to happen. And our greatest hope is that we must get to know Jesus in this time. I'm going to pass on that. Now, we found that inspiration told us that the thinking men would understand what was happening. Am I right? Now, does the Bible give us a picture of these thinking men? Yes or no? The Bible teaches us that history will do what? What text of the Bible? Matthew 2. But what text in the Bible tells us history will repeat itself? Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 9. The thing that hath been is the thing that shall be. There is what? Nothing new under the sun. In other words, history repeats itself. History is circular. Now in Matthew chapter 2, we get a, a demonstration of that history. Let's go back to Matthew 2. And I want us to notice something that we want to take a little further this evening. Let's go to Matthew chapter 2. And I want us to notice in Matthew chapter 2, two points. Because you will remember, brothers and sisters, that what happened before the first coming of Christ is an example of what's getting ready to happen as we approach the second advent of Christ. History will repeat itself. Is that true? Yes or no? All right, let's go to Matthew chapter 2. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In Matthew, the second chapter, notice now what the Bible says beginning in verse 1. Let's read that together. Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came what, everybody? Now give me another name for these wise men. All right. So at the first coming of Christ, there were these wise men. We can call them thinking men. Why do we call them thinking men? Talk to me, somebody. Because the prophet told us. <laughs> Everything the Bible says, the prophet says. And everything the prophet says, the Bible says. Do you believe that? Well, then you're almost a seven-day Adventist. <laughs> now, look what the Bible says. In Matthew chapter 2, it goes on to say, The wise men from the east of Jerusalem, saying, verse 2, saying, Where is he that is what? 
born king of the Jews, for we have seen his star and are come to worship him. Verse 3. When Herod the king heard these things, he was, what's the next word? So before the first coming of Christ, there was a time of what? A time of trouble. We're going to find out before the second coming of Christ, there will be another what? Time of trouble. Question. Were the wise men aware about this coming? Yes or no? They saw a star. They looked at nature. They looked at the signs. They looked at the events. And they recognized what was about to come. But do you know that that was not the only thing that confirmed what took place? See, that was the first thing. But then notice what happens in the type, because the same thing must happen in the antitype. Now, look what it says in verse 4. It says, and when he was gathered, all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be what? I want to ask you a question. Did they say, well, the wise men said he was going to be born at this time, so that's why we know he's going to be born. That's not what they said. What did they say? The Bible is rich, brothers and sisters. What did they say? Look what it says in verse four, uh, 5. It says, and they said unto him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for the wise men told us. It said, for thus it is written where? By the prophet. So my brothers and sisters, that tells us that what the wise men said was confirmed by the writings of the prophets. So the thinking men, what they say must be confirmed by the writings of the prophet. We can take all of God's prophets, my brothers and sisters. And they went to the prophets and they saw now, the reason why we know it had to be the prophets is because Micah only tells the place, but not the time. Daniel tells the time, but not the place. And so in order to get time and place, Jerusalem, at that time, you had to have the prophets. The Bible is good. Man, this thing is good. Oh, when my teacher used to study the Bible and he would go through it, it looks so good. I said, look, I want to study. I want to get it. Now, my brothers and sisters, look at this. The prophets. So what we have to do, most of what we spent our time with yesterday was just looking at Bible text, but then seeing that the wise men were confirming it. We need to look a little bit more at that, but then we need to finish by confirming it with the writings of what? The prophets. Does it make sense? So my brother says, this is what we're going to do now. Now, why am I studying with us? Because the wise men, look what the wise men say. Let me, let me read to you what the wise men say, because the prophet says, the present is a time of overwhelming interest to all living. Education 179, 180. Rulers and statesmen, men who occupy positions of trust and authority. What type of men? Talk to me. Give me a biblical name. Wise men, thinking men, and women of all classes have their attention fixed upon the events taking place about us. They are watching the strained, restless relations that exist among the nations. They observe the intensity that is taking possession of how much every earthly element and they, wise men, thinking men and women, recognize that something great and what else? Is not far away, but it's a what? About to take place that not just America or one country, but the world is on the verge of a great and what else? Talk to me, somebody. So the wise men, what they're looking at, they're seeing that a crisis, global crisis, is going to take place. Now, do they tell us a time, these wise men, yes or no? You know that the wise men in Matthew told us the time because Herod starts saying, we're going to search diligently for the time that the wise men said in Matthew chapter 2. So in any type, we see the same thing. Watch what they say. The historian writes that all negative trends that are plaguing America now are likely to get much worse, growing rapidly by... Well, we don't have to worry about that historian because he was wrong. Nothing happened in 2020. Now, this historian wrote this before 2020. And he's looking at history because history is circular. Now it says, it says, are likely to get much worse growing rapidly by what year? And would reach a critical mass no later than what? No later than 2030. So the wise men, and that's just one, we looked at one at the other, at the other, at the other. The wise men are saying between 2020, beginning to 2030, plus or minus, 
We see crisis beginning to start increasing, increasing, increasing. But then they say that something might happen in 2025, even before 2030. Is that what they say? Yes, that's what they say. Let's let you read it again. Make sure you read the handwriting. Amen. Let me put the handwriting on the wall. I'm going to put the handwriting up here. Let me put the handwriting on the wall. How America will collapse by what? By 2025. Alfred McCoy, that's the same historian that just said from 2020, 2030. Same man. Hist history. So he's telling us this. Now, your mind should begin to start saying, why is he telling us 2030 and 2025? But if you understand the Bible, he himself doesn't even know why he's using those words. But the Bible does. God does. And we're going to show you by the grace of God. Now, my brothers and sisters, we saw that in order to understand this, we cannot guess we have to have what? We have to have what? Accuracy. When a man is, has a gun and he's trying to have accuracy, what does he use on his gun? Something called a what? Scope. And in the scope, it has a what? Crosshair. And the crosshair is for the point of giving accuracy. Now, you see this crosshair. Does the 7 inch crosshair look like that? You going to help me tonight? You read it? What for? Accuracy. Now, my brothers and sisters, we went back. We looked. But then we see it says Satan has the ability to suggest what? You know, even with all that accuracy, Satan can suggest some down. And to devise objections to the pointed testimony that God sends. You know, anytime a pointed testimony will come, someone will make an excuse. Well, I don't like it because he or she, they said this. And we look at that instead of just looking at the word of God. It says, and many think it a virtue, a mark of intelligence in them to be unbelieving and question and quibble. Those who desire to doubt will have what? Now, I praise God. God's not like me. If, if, if God was like me, I would leave no room in the Bible for doubt. I would, lock the, I, I, would, I would lock it up so that there, there's no text that could be used. But God is not like me because he's more intelligent. See, there's a reason why he leaves room for doubt. When he leaves room for doubt, he gives us also the opportunity to exercise faith. No room for doubt, no need to exercise faith. So he gives us an opportunity to see and exercise faith. Why? Because in order to develop a friendship with God, we must exercise faith. Abraham was called the friend of God because of his faith in Christ. So my brothers and sisters, God is wiser than us. He does not mind if a person, he's not going to, he's going to give us an opportunity, even if we doubt, because he would have given us an opportunity to at least exercise faith to become his friend. I want to be his friend. Now this says, he gives what? Evidence. See, God does not even propose. In other words, he doesn't say he's just not going to do it. He does not even try to do it. He does not propose to remove how much? All occasion for unbelief. He gives evidence which must be how. Talk to me, somebody. Carefully investigated how. With not a prideful mind. Well, I don't care what it says. I don't care what they say or what the minister says or history says. Or I'm just going to look at it and say, yes, I saw it, but I don't believe it. I had a man. He came to, uh, uh, to, to the church we are in BTI. And he had been watching it uh, for a little while, but he appeared up there. And if he's watching now. I love you, brother, but I'm just telling this story. I'm not going to mention any names. But he, he was watching it. And when he came in. He act like he didn't know who we were or what was going on because we have visitors from around the world that come from watching. And so he was coming. We were, we were there. And at the very end, he said, now, I don't fully understand something that you're teaching. Can you teach me so that I can understand it from the Bible? And so I began to say, oh, it's all right. God loves to teach us. So let's just start looking at the word of God. And as I began to start showing him something, he said, that's wrong. I said, that's wrong. I didn't really say anything. <laughs> I just read a scripture. What, what do you mean? That's not what you're going to say is not right. And I, I said, well, now, and I, I started backing. Okay, well, let, let me show you another text. What, that's wrong. And after a while, the Holy Spirit said to me, don't say anything. So I stopped and I said, well, sir, it looks like that you actually came to teach me. And I said, look, I'm not infallible, so I love to learn. What, what would you like to share? And he began to start sharing something totally different. You, there's always a reason why the devil gets a person and trying to move us off base. My brothers and my sisters, God is different than us. And God is trying to help us to understand something. We should have a humble mind and a what? Teachable spirit. And all, not some, but all should decide from the weight of weight of evidence. Not just one point here, one there, one little text, or one misunderstood quotation. 
We look and look at quotation after quotation after quotation after quotation, text, 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 text. And then you might find one obscure text that many may not understand. Maybe a couple of quotations compared to hundreds upon hundreds. Which one has the weight? Talk to me, somebody. Now, it says, God gives sufficient evidence for the candidate mind to believe, but he who turns, he who turns from the weight of evidence, because there are a few things which he cannot make plain to his finite understanding, will be left in the what? Cold, chilling atmosphere of unbelief and questioning doubts, and will make what? Now, yesterday, I looked at one of those quotations that people use. Did we look at one of those, yes or no? Did we see that that's not what the quotation said? It does not attack this point. Well, I'm going to use another quotation tonight that many use to try to attack the clear teachings of the Bible that are not many, uh, normally understood. Now, we talked about his history being circular. We talked about these wise men. We talked about what was coming upon the world. We talked about the time frame. Ah, let me back that up. Let me see if I put it there. Let me go a little bit later. Let me, pass it. Let me, see, let me see if it's there. I may, I may have left. Ah, I hope I didn't leave it. Let me go a little further. Are you there? Ah, here it is. Praise the Lord. This is a quotation we looked yesterday. Now, now that I know it's there, let me back this up for a moment. <laughs> what does that say? Now, I'm not going to go back to all this because we, we studied some of this, but I want you to see the collapsologist. I wonder what a collapsologist is. The one who has studied the, how things collapse. Now, I want to ask you a question. Why, why are we studying? Why, why do we spend so much time yesterday studying that things are collapsing? I just want to make sure you, you know what we're doing. I don't want you to think that we're not doing something. See, now I'll be honest with you. This is not actually what I want to study with you. I'll be honest with you. What I really want to study with you is how, in detail, we can see the closeness that we need with Jesus so that we can become his friend. Now, this is part of that. And we're going to show you that. This is part of becoming a friend of God. If you follow his recipe, this is his, his, his method. God gives a method of how to be his friend. And this is his method. But this is not really what I want to study at this phase. I, I want us to be more detailed and actually, how does it happen? But you got to follow the order. Then I would love to be able to study with us. When you know God, there's a way that he lives. Every detail of his life. So that he can establish outpost centers. That would give a demonstration of how heaven lives on the earth. That would have an economy that does not need to buy or sell. And eat an economy in which we could have everything we need. So that when the crisis breaks physically and spiritually. We have an ark. An end time ark that will take us to the crisis. And like Joseph, we can actually help the world with every need. This is what I really wish we can study. But we cannot study that unless we make the exodus. And we'll never make the exodus unless we see that we're slaves and need to make the exodus. Are you following what I'm telling you? Now, I want to ask you a question. So why do you think that we're studying collapsing things? Well, why do you think we're spending time studying about things collapsing? Anybody know why? In God's plan, Revelation 14 says, we're not turning there, but Revelation 14 says, the second angel. Babylon is, is that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Babylon, that great. Now, the only time that people make an exit is when something falls. You know, the only biblical instruction to exit anything is when it's in a fallen condition. See, this is how you can help when a person says, well, I'm going to come out of the Seventh Adventist Church and I'm going to form an independent church or a so-called free Seventh Adventist Church or uh, this type of thing. When a person, see, the only time the Bible gives us uh, uh, the counsel to come out is when a church or a thing is in a fallen condition. Someone says, well, the seven evidence is fallen. The prophet says, it will appear as we are about to fall. So you know what it's really saying? It's going to appear like we would have to leave the church. But it will not fall. But the sinners in Zion will be shaken out. Our church is not going to fall. 
Now, my brothers and sisters, God is going to keep it and, and bring it back, but it's going to be a shaking, and over 90% of the church is going to be shaken out. We studied that detail another study before. This is why we cannot be reluctant to say we must study and pray now because there are many sincere souls that have no idea what we're studying. And in love, we have to go back to our churches and begin to start encouraging and, 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 and sharing and studying, and not condemnation, but what? Education. Now, my brothers and my sisters, when the Revelation 18 angel comes, he announces again, Babylon is what? And then he says, come out of her, what? Physically and spiritually is a call to come out. Now, physically, Babylon, or rather spiritually, Babylon is a corrupt church, a vile church, a false church, a, 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 a fornicating church, an impure church. And God is calling his people out of all false churches into his true biblical remnant church. But also, in a physical sense, it says Babylon, that great what? So if I'm going to come out of that great city, it is also a call physically to come out of the what? Out of the cities. So what must be revealed about the nation? What must be revealed about the world? In order to help us to see that we need to come out. That it is collapsing. That is the structure of the three angels messages. You will never start hygienic restaurants and food factories. Because that's not the purpose of the second angels message. That's not the purpose of the first angels message. That's the purpose of the God's purpose. And giving the third angels message. But there will never be a third. Without a second and first. So my brothers and sisters, it must first be demonstrated that the world is in a fallen condition, that the nations are in a fallen condition in order to cause us and the people to come where? Out. To make an exodus. Does it make sense? Yes or no? So now look at what the Bible says in Luke chapter 6. What does it mean for something to fall? What does it mean for something to fall? Now look what the Bible says in Luke chapter 6. Go in your Bible to Luke chapter 6. What book did I say? We're going to Luke chapter 6. I hope I'm not going too fast. Am I going too fast? If I'm going too fast, I would have to speed up and then slow down. Now, Luke chapter 6 and verse 49. You remember the parable of the wise and foolish man? Remember that parable? Well, now notice what the Bible says about the foolish man. Luke 6 verse 49. In it, it talks about the fall. In Luke chapter 6 verse 49, let's read that together. The Bible says, but he that what? Heareth and doeth it not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth against which the stream did beat what vehemently and immediately it what? All right. Well, what did it mean that it fell? And the ruin of that house was great. When something falls, it is what? So to fall means something has been what? Ruined. Now watch it now. You better listen to what I'm telling you. Now question. Did Babylon get ruined before God brought his people literally out of Babylon? Yes or no? Literal Babylon. Go to Jeremiah. Let's look. Go to Jeremiah chapter 51. Go to Jeremiah 51 and notice what the Bible says in Jeremiah 51. And we want to see how literally Babylon fell. Because you're going to find out that all books of the Bible meet and end in the book of Revelation. In order to understand Babylon spiritually, we study Babylon literally, physically, and it gives us an understanding. Look at Jeremiah 51. That's when Babylon literally fell. Look at Jeremiah chapter 51. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Jeremiah 51. Notice now at the beginning of the chapter. Jeremiah 51. Speaking about Babylon. Beginning in verse 6. Let's read that together. Jeremiah 51 beginning in verse 6. It says, what's the first two words? Give me another name to flee out. Give me another name. Exit. Exodus. Out of Babylon. It says flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver what? Talk to me somebody. Do you know that if we do not make the exodus, we are lost. Deliverance is the result of making the exodus with Jesus Christ. It says deliver every man his soul. Be not what? Now what language does that sound like? Cut off. That sounds like day of atonement language. Now, it says that you be not cut off in her iniquity, for this is the... So Babylon failed, guess what? 
on time. So if spiritual, a literal Babylon fell on time, guess what? Spiritual Babylon in Revelation must also fall, guess what? On time. Now, notice what it says. Let's continue. So the Bible says in verse uh, uh, 7, uh, let's finish verse 6. For this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense. Almost exact words from Revelation 18. Verse 7, it says, Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made how much? All they have drunken. Does it sound like the second angel's message? Yes or no? The nations. What is nations? That's the world. Have drunken of her wine. Therefore, the nations are what? Now, what is one of the greatest evidence that a man is drunk? What does he normally do when, he's, when a man gets drunk? How you, when you test him, what does he do? He staggers. And then he does what? Falls. Now, my brothers and sisters, watch what it says in verse 8. Babylon is suddenly fallen and what else? So to fall means something is ruined or it is what? Now, I want to ask you a question. When the children of Israel left Egypt, what was the condition of Egypt? In a fallen state. Now, how do I know that Israel, or, or Egypt rather, was in a fallen state in order for them to make Exodus? Well, let's go to Exodus. That'll be the best book to find out. Am I right? Let's go to Exodus chapter 10. Let's go there quickly. Exodus chapter 10. Notice what the Bible says. In Exodus chapter 10, the Bible tells us. Now, what does it mean to fall biblically? I didn't make this up. Do you know it's a wonderful thing? When everything you believe is in the word of God. That's wonderful. You don't have to make nothing up. You don't have to say anything. You can just go from text to text and let the Bible explain itself. Do you know that all Seventh-day Adventism is, is the religion of the Bible? Now, look at what the Bible says. Notice what the Bible says very carefully. As we look at this in Exodus chapter 10. Exodus chapter 10. And we want to pick up now in verse 7. You know the plagues are falling in Exodus 10. The plagues are falling. The Exodus is about to take place. In Exodus chapter 10, notice the condition of Egypt. In Exodus chapter 10, now what did the fall represent? A fall is when something is what? Ruin and what else? All right, Exodus 10, verse 7. Exodus 10 and verse 7. What does the Bible say in verse 7? Exodus 10, verse 7, it says, And Pharaoh's servants said unto him, How long shall this man be a snare unto us? Let the man what? Let him go. Why? That they may serve the Lord their God. Knowest thou not yet that Egypt is what? Talk to me. That either Egypt is what? Talk to me somebody. And if it's destroyed, what is it? Talk to me. Fallen. So you could say Egypt is fallen. Is fallen. You didn't get it. Praise God. <laughs> You can say, they, look, they were, they were given the second angel's message. Egypt is fallen, is fallen. Exit out of her. Come out of her. This is what God is telling us. So my brothers and sisters, what was the condition of Egypt when the exodus was, was being made? What, what was happening to Egypt? It was what? Falling, collapsing. What was happening to her economy? Destroyed. What was happening to her political system? Destroyed. What was happening to our military might? Destroyed. All of them inside that Red Sea. All the Egyptians slaughtered their military might. Can you imagine? They had some green berets in there. They had some Navy SEALs. But there's a difference between a Navy SEAL and a Heavenly SEAL. Amen. <laughs> so my brothers and sisters, they had all the, the high mechanized army. And they all died in that Red Sea. The Exodus, the people of God came out. Now, my brothers and sisters, so then, why are we showing us that America and the world is collapsing? Why are we doing that? So we know now, if we see America and the world collapsing, it is time to come out. It is not time to go deeper into the world's education, deeper into the world's occupations, deeper into the world's recreation, deeper into the world's activity. It's time to start leaving that behind and saying, Jesus, take me, take me, please. We've got to leave some things behind, brothers and sisters. Now, do you see what we're doing? Yes or no? So now as we come back to the world, we see that it's collapsing. This collapsology, they're studying this. We begin to look at the numbers. We saw when they said, I'm not going back to the wrong, we looked at it. We saw when they said it was going to collapse, the American pol polity is cracked and might what? Give me another name. Paul, give me another name. Roy, give me another name. Destroy. And if it's so, then we need to be doing what? Come out. Now watch. 
the U.S. is becoming increasingly ungovernable and somewhat. Now, who is telling us that these things are collapsing all around us? Who is telling us this? Experts, thinking men, wise men. But we still got to come to point number two and do what? Confirm it by the writings of the prophets before it happens. Now, my brothers and sisters, we saw and how I talked about people from all over, experts all over. By what did they say? By what? 2025, American democracy could collapse, cause an extreme domestic political instability, including widespread civil violence. By 2030, if not sooner, the country should be governed by right wing, uh, could be governed by right wing dictatorship. In other words, plus or. These are the experts. These are the experts. These are the wise men. We were told this would happen. It's happening. I am a what? What's that next word? I am a what? Scholar of violent conflict for more than what? Now, can you imagine someone, can you imagine how foolish it would sound, a foolish man standing up say, you know what? I don't believe that uh, I see signs of conflict and collapse in America. I don't believe it. And then the man says, uh, you ask him, well, how long have you been studying collapsing or collapsology? Well, I, I haven't studied it at all, but I still believe that it's not happening. That's not wisdom. That's what? Foolishness. And that's what the foolish man does. He builds his house on sand and he falls. He's ruined. He's destroyed. Now, my brothers and sisters, look what it says. This is history. We're looking at history. Now, here is uh, another statement that people use. I got back to where we were. The last day of Vince 36. I plainly stated at the Jackson camp meeting. Now, they normally don't start this far up, but I, I'm starting to make up this way. To these fanatical parties that were doing the work of the adversary souls. Now, I'm going to tell you what they say first, and I'm going to read it. Have you ever heard it said, well, you know, this 2025 plus or minus, it, you, you, you cannot really do that because there are no time prophecies after what? Have you ever heard that before? It's interesting sometimes that we're not careful when we study the Bible or the spirit of prophecy. Now, let's look at the statement. It says they claim to have great light that probation would close in October of what? 1884. I there stated in public that the Lord had been pleased to show me that there would be, let's read that again. No. Once again, we see the exact thing. No what? Definite time in the message given of God since what? So 1844 qualifies definite time. So how was the message given in 1844? How was the message given in 1844? How did they pronounce the time? What did they say? What did they say? That on what? October 22nd. 1844, something's happened. That is called what? Definite time. Day. It will be hour if they actually put the actual hour on it. You know. <laughs> but that's what day and hour is talking about. Day and hour is talking about definite time. Now, my brothers and sisters, it says, the people will not have another message upon time. Is that what it says? Do you know every time the prophet does this, she always qualifies what she means. And it's amazing. We add to the quotation, but you can't do that. you got to leave it just like it says. No one will ever be able to say in 2025, Jesus is coming. That would be a false message. What God says is that we can know about when, and we're going to show you that from Scripture. So my brothers and sisters, when we say plus or minus, it could be a little bit what? More. Or it could be a little bit what? Less. And the conditions or the events show us Without a shadow of a doubt. And we're going to watch. It says, the people will, never, ne will not have another message upon definite time after this period of time, Revelation 10, reaching from 1842 to 1844. You know why I coach Revelation 10? Everybody know, know why? In Revelation 10, an angel stands and puts one foot on the land and one foot on the sea, and he raises his hand and says what? Time shall be what? And so because of that, they say, well, there'll be another message on time. But that's not what the text meant, nor that's not what the prophet uh, uh, said it meant. So now my brothers and sisters... Some people say, oh, there's definitely no more definite time prophecies. Let me tell you something. There are time prophecies after 1844. Someone said, how do you know? Well, let's look at it. Look at Revelation 8. Look at Revelation chapter 8. Go to Revelation 8. Notice what the Bible says. Remember, we have to have evidence. You say something, it had to be evidence. Biblical evidence. Now, in Revelation chapter 8, notice what the Bible says in Revelation 8. Now, in Revelation 8, if you remember the chapter uh, 4, 5, and 6, is dealing with the seven seals. Does the seventh seal take us to the beginning of time or the end of time? Now, in Revelation 8, notice what the Bible says, beginning in verse 1. Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1, the Bible says, And when he had opened what seal, everybody? The seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of what? Half an hour. 
Now, every Adventist, every early Adventist knows what that means. Somebody said, I heard somebody say it. Do you know what, if you study a, 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 in Bible prophecy, a day represents, a, 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 equals a year, and Numbers 4, uh, 6 tells, tells it, 1434, tells us that? Then, then, brothers and sisters, when we know that, then, then, then you do the math, you just easily do the math and you work it out, guess what you get? You get an hour representing two weeks and half an hour representing a little over seven days. About seven days. Now, have we been told in the spirit of prophecy anything about a seven-day trip? Yes or no? This is the biblical foundation. This is a time prophecy after 1844. But guess what? It's not a definite time prophecy. When will the half an hour start? When will the seven years start? Can you give me a day and hour? Yes or no? So it is a time prophecy, but it is not a definite time prophecy. So you must study the Bible and the spirit of prophecy very carefully. Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and, but everything we believe at least on two or three witnesses. Let's just go to one more tonight. Go to Revelation chapter 20. What book did I say? Revelation chapter 20. Notice what the Bible says, Revelation 20. Revelation 20, we see Jesus come down. And Revelation 20 verse 1, the Bible says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain was in his what, everybody? Hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him. How long? This is be after 1844 or before 1844? Is this a time prophecy? So then there are time prophecies. Is it going to be a thousand years? Exactly a thousand years? Yes. So here's another time prophecy after 1844. But guess what? When can we start that thousand year period? What date can you give me? Can you give me an October? Can you give me a year? Can you do that? Yes or no? So while it is a time prophecy, it is not a what? Definite time prophecy. We can know the time. The Bible says, and that knowing the time. So we can know the time, but not definite time after 1844. Does it make sense? Yes or no? Is the Bible clear? So my brothers and sisters, we know that that's not what it's saying because the Bible is clear. And the Bible and the prophet don't contradict. So what it is telling us is not that there's not another time prophecy. In fact, if we were, we'll give you another one. We would tell you there's a time prophecy longer than all of that. There's a time prophecy that takes us from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. Guess how much time in that time prophecy? 7,000 years. 6,000 where? On earth? And that last 1,000 in Revelation 20, where? Every seven of that That's what the song was about. All who speak the truth must say, it was man who changed the day, for in God's word, no change appears through the whole. I wonder why it's out of the hymnal now. <laughs> You say, oh, we, 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 we don't believe. You know, every pioneer believe what I'm talking about right now. Every pioneer. But they have to study in the midnight sometimes in order to know it. <laughs> now, look, look what it said. Now, my brothers and sisters, no man, no the day, no the hour, was the argument most often brought forward by the rejectors of the Advent faith. The scripture is, of that day and hour knoweth what? No man, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. But notice what it says. A clear and harmonious explanation of this text was given by those who were looking for the Lord. And the wrong use made of it by their opponents was clearly seen. So there's a wrong way to use Matthew 24 that no man knows the day or the hour. There's a wrong way to use that text. And there is a right way. And today, many are using it in the wrong way. But then it says, one saying of the Savior must not be made to do what? And can you imagine somebody taking one that we should never say that we can know the day and hour because we're not going to take one text to destroy another. We're going to show the harmony of how they all fit together. The Bible doesn't contradict itself. It's harmonious. The spirit of prophecy doesn't contradict itself. It's harmonious when you understand God's plan. Now, this says, though no man knoweth the day nor the hour of his coming, we are, what's the next word? instructed now do you see what it's doing it's saying don't let one text destroy another so don't let no man know the day and hour stop us from understanding that we that we are instructed and what's that next word require what does require mean it's not an option 
We are required to know when it is what? So my question is, how near? Is that a good question? Because required means that you must. Now, what if I don't, what if I don't know? What if I don't know if it's near? What does the Bible say? Let's go to Matthew 24. Let's go there quickly. Go to Matthew 24. Notice what the Bible says in Matthew 24. Matthew, the 24th chapter. If we don't know that it is near, let's go to Matthew 24. Hold your hand there. Now, notice what it says. It says, we are instructed to and required to know what is near. We are further taught that to disregard his warning and refuse or neglect to know when his advent is, what's that next word? Near will be wonderful for us. What does fatal mean? So if a man was driving a motorcycle and he gets hit, knocks on the ground, and you say that the accident was a fatality, does that man get up or is he dead? Now, my brothers and sisters, what happens if we do not know when God is near, the coming of Christ is near? What happens? We're dead. So then the question is, how near? Because our life depends on it. Life and death. It says, it will be as fatal for us as it was for those who lived in the days of Noah, not to know when the flood was what? What happened to those that did not know the flood was coming? They were destroyed. They were ruined. They fell with the fall. Now, my brothers and sisters, then my question is, how near? And the only one I want to give the answer is Jesus in the Bible. Is that a good, is that a good, a good practice? Look at Matthew 24. Let's look. You remember the question came in verse 3 what, uh, uh, when, when they asked Jesus, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the... So what did they want to understand? The sign of his coming and of the end of the world. Now, if I'm going to come to the final generation, then that means that the world must come to an end. A limit is an end of something, not the beginning of something. So my brothers and my sisters, Jesus tells them signs by which they may know when the end of the world is about to take place. Look at verse 32. Verse 32, Matthew 24, verse 32. Please, now, if I heard what I taught you last night from the scripture, 2025 20, plus or minus, I would make sure that every text that is being used, that I see it for myself. It says, look at what the Bible says. Matthew 24, beginning in verse 32. The Bible says in verse 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When its branches yet tender and put it forth leaves, you guess that the summer is nigh. You know, no guessing. You know that summer is nigh. Give me another name for nigh. You mean to tell me the same God that in verse 36 said that we are not to know the day and the hour also said that, we're to know, that we are to know when he is near so that we are not to make them destroy each other, but harmonize together. So then it says in verse 20, uh, 20, 32, you know that the summer is nigh. I mean, think about it this way. This is my teacher. used to always tell me. And I say, that makes sense to me. You go outside and it's winter time. What happens to the leaves on the tree if you're in a country that gets cold? What happens to the leaves on the tree? They fall off. All of a sudden in the spring of that year, what happens to the leaves on the tree? They begin to start growing and coming back on. Now, do you go over to your neighbor? Neighbor, the leaves are on the tree. What does it mean? Or do you know the time? Based on the leaves, based on the events, based on the signs, you're able to see the season. So my brothers and sisters, notice what the Bible says in Matthew 24. He says in verse 33, Jesus, the Prince of Teachers, uses that object lesson. And verse 33, it says, so likewise, in the same manner, when you shall, what's the next word? So will this be visible or invisible? So we'll be able to see it. It says, when you shall see, how much? All these things, don't ask your preacher. Don't go to your neighbor. Don't guess. It says, know that it is what? Ah, we're, that's important now because remember, the prophet says, while we may not know the day and hour, we are instructed and required to know that it is what? Well, then our question is, how near? We want the Bible to explain it. So the Bible says in verse 30, uh, 33, know that it is near even where at the... So the Bible says, while we may not know the day and hour before the close of probation, we should know that it is near, and that near means even where. So my question would be, I know now that I must know when he's at the door. 
My question would be, well, what does it mean to be at the door? Is that a good question? How near does that mean? Because, you know, if I, if I said somebody's coming to this room, they're at the door, you say, that's very what? But that's not giving me a, a, a clear understanding of what nearness really is. In order to understand nearness, we must allow the Bible to do what? Explain itself. So notice what the Bible says. In the next verse, it explains what it means to be at the door. Verse 34 says, verily what? Now, what does the word verily do? Does it change the subject? You remember Jesus talking to Nicodemus when he said, you must be born again. Remember that? Nicodemus said, can a man go back up into his mother's womb? And Jesus, he, Nicodemus knew what Jesus was talking about. And Jesus did not change his preaching. Jesus lovingly looked at him and said, you must be what? But before he said that, he said, verily, verily, unless a man is born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot see nor enter the kingdom of God. Now, my brother and sister, did Jesus change his subject when he said verily? What does verily do? Not change a subject. Verily makes the subject or the point more clear and more emphatic. In other words, it says, if you do not understand what I mean, let me make it plain. That's what verily means. So now my brothers and sisters, watch now. Jesus says we must know it's coming as near or we're destroyed. Then he says, and how near? Even at the doors. Someone says, well, I don't know what that means. So Jesus says, well, verily, let me plainly tell you what it means. Let's read verse 34 together. Verse 34 says, Verily I say unto you, what? This generation shall what? Not pass till how much? All these things be what? Now what generation shall not pass? That is the boundary generation. Remember we read yesterday that a boundary is something that you cannot what? Pass. That a limit is something that you cannot pass. So this generation is the limit generation. This generation is the last generation. This generation is the final generation. So the Bible is telling us that while we may not know the day and hour, that we should be able to know the final generation that is here to see the coming of the Lord. And my brothers and sisters, one of the things that we should see is everything doing what? Collapsing. Do we see that right now? Then what does that mean about this generation? This is the last one. This shall not pass. Once we get in there now, God is trying to take us a little further. Let's go a little further. How are we going to get closer to understand this? It says, the history which the great I am has marked out in his word, uniting link at the link in the prophetic chain, from eternity in the past to eternity in the future, tells us what? Now remember now, all these wise men were telling us about this. We must go back also to the writings of the prophets before we close to understand this. Now, look at what this says. All that what prophecy has foretold is coming to the past and to the present time has been traced on the pages of. So we're going to have to go to understand this. We've got to go to what? History. History. It says, and we may be assured that how much? Not some. All which is yet to come will be fulfilled. How? Do you know that seasons have an order? What is the order? Spring, what? Summer, what? Fall, what? Winter. And then what happens the next year? Spring, summer, fall, winter. The seasons repeat themselves in order, just like history. So my brothers and sisters, we know that something happened because this says, let me back this up. This says we should find out where we are. What's the next word? You know, we're not in 2025 today. Where are we today? So then what we need to do before we close is find out where we are and what. Then we'll be able to see how close we are to 2025 plus or minus. Now, my brothers and sisters, watch this. This is what year? What year is this? 2022. What month? July what? That's not long ago, is it? Putin. The Washington Post. You're reading, uh, it says, the apocalyptic vision behind what? Putin's what two words? Golden billion. Remember a couple of nights ago, I asked you, did you, did you hear about golden billion? That was the, the main thing he said in his speech. And I said, did you hear golden billion? You know what you told me? You said, no, I never heard golden billion. Do you know, brothers and sisters, when you hear words, you better look them up and understand what they mean. That's a serious statement of what Putin made. In fact, watch. For Russian President Vladimir Putin, a two-word phrase sums up. What does sum up mean? It explains everything. 
sums up the current state of what? World geopolitics. And what were the two words? Golden million. What's he talking about? You want to know what he's talking about? It says, speaking this week in Moscow, Putin declared that the model of total domination of the so-called golden billion is unfair. Why should this golden billion have what? All the population on the globe dominate over everyone and impose its own rules of behavior. Now, that golden building was a uh, theory that was put forth by uh, a man there. It was very prominent in Russia, but it, be it became well known. And what it said was that there's a theory, there's a, a, a plan by the Western governments of this world to destroy the majority of the world and leave only the Western countries left, one billion, to enjoy all of the resources that exist in the world. The water, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the salt, the palladium, the, the, the food, all of the resources that man, gold and all the rest. Now, when you, know, if you look at this, now it's amazing. So what would, if, how much in the world today? How many people in the world today? There's over 7 billion in the world today. Now, my brothers and sisters, we're almost at 8 billion. We're 7 billion plus. Now, if the 1 billion program was what was being said, what would have to happen to the world? Talk to me. What would have to happen to the world? Over 6 billion people would have to be wiped out. That would be that we're nearing what? What would you call humanity? You better watch this, brothers and sisters. Nearing extinction. Someone says, we would never see mass annihilation like that. I'm going to tell you something. We're not ready for this, brothers and sisters. Were the Hebrews ever put under mass extermination? Were the Jews ever put under mass extermination? Could you ever be put under mass extermination? Are we ready for this? Do you think that we need to spend more time getting ready for this? Do you want to understand some more? Now look at what it says. My brothers and sisters, you're in Matthew 24. Now watch it now. 40 years after initial publi uh, publication, a study called what? Limits to growth is looking depressingly prescient. In other words, like it had foreknowledge. It was written in 1972. This says, if civilization continue on its path, by the way, this is a popular science, these are the thinking men, path toward increasing consumption, the global economy would what? Collapse by what? So by 2030 plus or minus, we need to be coming out. This is what this tells us. Population what? I wonder how much population loss. I see somebody thinking. <laughs> As reported in Australian broadcast ABC, the model's calculations took into account trends in pollution level. In other words, the way they got 2020, 20, 30, they didn't just make up a number. They were looking at resources. They were looking at population. They were looking at uh, evidence, events, data. Uh, they were looking at trends in population growth, pollution levels, the amount of natural resources, which are limited, overall quality of life on Earth. And then they found out that the model's predictions for the worsening quality of life and the dwindling natural resources have so far been what? In other words, you don't have the time, but I took the time to look at it. If you go to 1972 and you say everything that the model showed would happen all the way up into 2030, and then you put down what literally happened, it looks almost exactly the same. That model from over 40 years ago said, in fact, now this is what it said 40 years ago. 2020 is the first milestone. Envision. That's when the quality of life is supposed to drop what? The broadcaster presented this scenario that will lead to the, it will lead to the demise of what? Did something happen in 2020 that began wiping out members of the population? At around 2020, the condition of the planet becomes what? Highly critical. If we do nothing about it, the quality of life goes down to what do, you, what do you think would happen to the world if it went down to zero? Extinction. Pollution becomes so serious, they will start to kill people, which in turn will cause the population to diminish lower than it was in what? Now, if you're intelligent, what would you do if you're intelligent? Find out what the population was in 1900. Let me ask you a question. What do you think the population was in 1900? It sounds like you're, you're a thinking woman, thinking man. <laughs> You'll find out that, that history tells us 
that it was less than 2 billion people in the world in 1900. Are we ready for this? Now, what I'm telling you, you don't have to make it's facts, evidence, undisputable, undeniable. You can look at it for yourself. Now, my brothers and sisters, when we look at what's going on, our mind, now, now someone says, but, 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 but we'll never become extinct. Nothing like this will ever take place. Well, let's look at Matthew 24. Is that all right? Look what the Bible says. Notice what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 24. Look at what the Bible says in verse 21. Let's read verse 21. It says, for then shall be what, everybody? Then shall be what? Great tribulation. Give me another name for tribulation. Trouble. Such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever what? Now let's read verse 22 together. It says, and except those days shall be shortened, there should what? No flesh be saved. What would happen if there were no flesh? Extinction. So the Bible says that in the natural order of things, man would become extinct unless God cuts it short. Now, next to a question. Is there ever a time but the Bible says there will be no flesh on the earth. Will there ever be a time that the Bible says no flesh on the earth? I'm not talking about the beginning in Genesis. There was a time before man, God created man on the first six days, there was no flesh on the earth. But there's another time because the earth is going to be brought back to that same condition. There's a chapter in Great Controversy, a whole chapter on this called the desolation of the earth. If you read it tonight, your hair will stand up on your head. Even if you didn't have hair, it will find a way to come out. You know, <laughs> and so somebody, somebody might say, man, this is better than a tonic, you know. <laughs> now, my brothers and sisters, something would take place. I read that. And I'm telling you, what, 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 what do we call the time when there's no flesh on the earth? Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. What do we call the time when there's no flesh on the earth? The end of the day of atonement. When does Jesus come out of the most holy place? At the end of the day of atonement. Extinction. Now, my brothers and sisters, where do the wise men say that extinction might take place? This is talking about extinction. Here we go again. Earth's major mass extinction. This is what the scientists. Human extinction by what? Plus or minus. Now, the scientists, they're looking at this. There is almost unanimous agreement among the climate scientists and organization. That is 97% of over 10,000 climate scientists. The evidence, remember, we have to decide from the weight of the evidence in relation to the destruction of the Earth's biosphere, leading to ongoing and rapid degradation of the all ecosystems and their services, is readily available and what? In other words, the evidence is there, but we're not looking at it. We put our eyes closed and say, you know what? I think things are going to go on as normal. But my brothers and sisters, they did that at the flood too. They said Noah was a crazy fanatic preaching and preaching and preaching. But when the flood came, they wished that they had listened. It says, the many and varied forms of destruction are having synergetic impact. All happening at one time. An insignificant, an, ins, an insignificant amount of the vast evidence in relation to this destruction is sampled above. In other words, you read it, you'll see it gives some evidence, but I'm not going through that. Now, let's read this together. Let's read this together. What does it say? If you can see it, let's read it together. It says what? There is a notable group. What does it mean by notable? There's some little, nobody really. In, there's a notable group of what? Prominent climate scientists who present compelling evidence that human extinction will occur by what? 2026. Now, my brothers and sisters, in the natural order of things, let me tell you something. If we make it 225, it will be nothing short of a divine miracle. Wow. 
We want to harmonize our minds so that nothing is destroyed in the word of God. We don't want anything to distract us. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is telling me something. God is trying to show us this evidence. We're decide from the weight of what? In the sanctuary. Will Jesus come out of the most holy place? Would it be interesting if that he's supposed to come out 20, 25 plus or, or 20, 30 plus or, look at this now. Who is this? But not, not literally, you know, <laughs> in the picture. The representation of the what? Fit man. Who is he holding? Is that biblical? What book of the Bible? Leviticus 16. Let's go there quickly. Leviticus 16. Let's go there quickly. Do you know that this is what brought us seven of innocence into existence? This is our origin. Look at Leviticus 16. In Leviticus 16 chapter. Now, I don't have time to go through this. We're getting ready to close. I don't have time to go through this. What I'm getting ready to show us, though, is that there's something called the beginning of the Day of Atonement, and there's something called the... When was the beginning of the Day of Atonement? On October 22nd, 1844, right? But in Leviticus 16... Let's go to the end of the Day of Atonement, in, in, in the type, in the shadow. What verse would I go to if I want to look at the end of the Day of Atonement? What verse would I go to? Verse 20 says, and when he have made a what? End of reconciling the holy place, that is the most holy, and the tabernacle of the congregation, that is the holy, and the altar, he shall bring the, what everybody? The priest is a symbol of Jesus. The live goat is a symbol of who? Now watch it now, watch it. Look what the Bible says. In verse 21, it says, and Aaron, the priest, shall lay both his hands on what? Not the tail, not the back, but the what? Head of the scapegoat. You know what I'm talking about. Now, notice what it says in verse, once he does that, look what it says in verse 22, uh, verse uh, 21, uh, going down further. He's going to confess over him some things. And then at the last line, it says, and shall send him where? Away by the hand of a... By the hand of a, where? Into the wilderness. Well, what is the wilderness? Look what it says in the next verse. What does the next verse say? And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land. What's the next two words? Not inhabited. So what is the wilderness? What? Not inhabited. And he shall let go the goat where? So the wilderness is a desolate, uninhabited place. It's the desolation of the earth. So the earth must become desolate with no inhabitant in order for the Day of Atonement to come to an end. The Day of Atonement cannot come to an end until there's no flesh on the earth. What's going to happen to make no flesh come on the earth? Talk to me. Talk to me, somebody. Then shall the Lord descend from heaven. The trumpet is going to sound. The dead in Christ shall what? Rise first. Can you imagine seeing all our loved ones? Can you imagine? I can see my teacher flying up in the air. This thing is good. <laughs> then they which are what? Alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in there, and so shall we. So all the righteous are going to be taken to heaven. Right? Now the wicked. Revelation 1 says that every eye shall see him. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 says, and when they see him, it says that they're going to be slain, that, that everyone on the earth is going to be slain by the brightness of his coming. Who's left on the earth? No flesh. Now the day of atonement can come to an end. What event makes the earth have no flesh? The second coming of Jesus Christ. And guess what? It has to happen on time. The day of atonement happens on time. Now, I'm going to close this. I can't, I can't even go through the, the depth of this. We talk about America Expression Date, Fox News. And remember, I told you Fox News because some people think CNN is fake news. So Fox News, they believe that. So Fox News says, America Expression Date, well, U.S. collapse, fall, by in what? 
Remember when we went through and we showed uh, 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 where this concept came from? It says nations are made up. Uh, 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 it says. It says nations. Uh, uh, like library books be renewed if one wishes to keep it beyond the date stamped on the back. If you are too young to remember libraries and borrowing books, think of the date stamped on milk cartons, which indicate its sell by date beyond the which the milk can what? So on a, on a, on a milk carton, there's always an ex expiration date, right? You can tell when it's getting ready to expire. And he said in his new book, America's Expiration Date, The Fall of Empires and Superpowers, and the Future of the United States, I examine eight empires that believe that the economic strength and military power were enough to sustain them well into the future and the case of the Roman Empire. Now, this man is building his case from another book. This book is inspired by the late British diplomat Sir John Glubb, who found a pattern in the decline of nations. He said that the pattern has not changed in what? So all of human history written down, he said he found a pattern. Historical pattern, studying history. Now, what, let's see what Sir John Glubb found when he looked at that pattern. Let's see what he found to see why he was saying. Now, this is Sir John Glubb. This is his book, The Fate of Empires. Now, it says he found out something. He said, the experiences of the human race have been recorded in more or less detail for somewhat 4,000 years. If we attempt to study such a period of time, 4,000 years, and as how many countries? As many countries as possible, we seem to discover the same patterns constantly doing what? Is that what the Bible says? It will repeat itself. Yes or no? It says, under widely different conditions of climate, culture, and religion, no matter what their background was, their culture, their religion, their technology, or whatever, it all happened that the empire stayed and existed for the same amount of time. What was the average amount of time? Well, it sounds like you were, you've been remembering from yesterday. Praise the Lord. Now, look what he says. The only thing we learn from history is that men, what? Never learn from history. So if every nation has been dropping at the same time, dropping, 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 as many as you can find all over the world, the same average, why would you think that this nation wouldn't do the same thing? 4,000 years. This is history. Now, what he showed us was, he started going through naming some of the nations and looked at them and went through them in detail. We don't have time to go through the nations and what have you. He goes through some more points. Guess what he finds? From conquest to affluence to collapse, the 200 and what, 50-year empire uh, life cycle. In 1977, Sir John Glubb, let me blow that up. In 1977, Sir John Glubb wrote an essay entitled The Fate of Empires. During three millenniums, the average superpower's duration period has been consistently about what, 250 years. The full 250-year cycle corresponds to about 10, 20, 10 25-year generations. I want to go through all that. But it shows us this. Now, you remember we did on the board, we wrote 1776 over here. That's when America did what? Declared independence. We added 200 and what? And what year did we get? 2026. So about 2026 is the average time. Plus or that America would do like every other nation and fall to her demise. Science, history, politicians, economists, all through every field of knowledge, we looked at evidence after evidence after evidence, not from peons, but from expert and expert and expert. All saying the same thing. And then we turn, and someone says, well, I don't believe it. What have you studied? Nothing. What have you been looking at? Netflix. What is it telling you? A lie. And all liars will be found in the lake of fire. Now, my brothers and sisters, never look at a lie if you want to be with Jesus, because he's not a lie. He's the truth. And the truth will make us free. Now, my brothers and sisters, the average empire survives for what? Is America at death's, even at the, this generation shall not what? Pass till all these things be. Do you see why God is trying to get us ready now? Yes or no? You see why he's trying to wake us up now? Please get a relationship with me. Don't let anything turn you back. Um, brothers and sisters, it goes through. We talked to some of this. I don't want to go through all this. We talked about some of this yesterday. We talked about the fourth turn. I'm not going to go back through that now. We look at the first turn. The first, fourth turning actually takes us right back again to 20 what? 25. Goes through the same history. Different line of history, but it goes through the same thing. And it brings us right back to the same place. All these knowledges telling us exactly the same thing. And if you understand the coming events is like a what? What happens when you start getting to the last puzzle? Is it hard to put it together? 
When you get to the last puzzle, do you know that a child, you could have been putting together a thousand piece puzzle and it could have took you days. All of a sudden, a child at five years old can come into the room at five years old and look at the puzzle and say, that piece goes where? Am I right or wrong? Do you know that right now you can have a child today? A child, a seven minutes child that can look at 2022 and say, looking at the evidence and the Bible and Spirit of said, this is the final generation. A child. Now, my brothers and sisters, that final piece is the passing of a what? National. That's the last act in the drama. Satan says, I've got to shut down the church by this time. If I don't shut them down, Jesus will come out of the most holy place. And if Jesus comes out of the most holy place on time, what's going to happen to Satan's head? Talk to me, somebody. It's going to be crushed. And Eden lost can be Eden restored. The plan of redemption can be complete. And you and I can live with Jesus forever and ever and ever and live happily. It's not a fairy tale. It's the story of redemption. Now, my brothers and sisters, but before the National Sunday Law comes, guess what? Civil War. But the fourth turning tells us in the fourth turning that the fourth turn will lead us to a civil war. 2025. Plus or minus. Now, brothers and sisters, 2020 begin this. Watch what the prophet says. This is 1899 in India. What else? China. What else? Russia and the cities of America. Thousands of men and women are dying of starvation. The money men, rich because they, uh, the money men, the rich because they have the power, control the what? They purchase at low rates and all they can obtain and then sell at what? Greatly increased prices. This means what? So just before the Civil War, what will we see happening in the world? You better, you better watch this, brothers and sisters. Before the Civil War, we will see what? Starvation. But we don't, we don't see any starvation in 2022. We don't see a food shortage in 2022. We don't see a famine in 2022, do we? Oh, yes, we do. You better watch it. It says, this means starvation for the poor classes and will result in a civil war. Now, what happens after the civil war? Then there will be a what? Such as never was. When, that, when does that happen when there's a time of trouble? What happens when there's a time of trouble that such as never was? That means he's finished his work in the most holy place. So my brothers and sisters, when we see the civil war, it's an indication that the priest is about to finish his work and leave the most holy place. The civil war is the bell before the Sunday law that tells us. And my question is, are we about to see the civil war? But in America, never another civil war. That was 1861. We are so united now. Look at our name. United States. But you and I know the only thing united among us is the name. We're divided politically, economically, socially, religiously, every other way. Now, my brothers and my sisters, God is trying to help us to see this now. Now, look at what this says. Russian President Vladimir Putin. Well, now, how did Putin get in here? We're talking about Jesus leaving the most holy place. Recently told lawmakers that the war in what? How did the war in Ukraine get in this? We just are talking about Jesus leaving the most holy place. Or is there a connection? Putin took aim in a Western response to the war and was started Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which included tough sanctions that his country has to have to what? They should have realized that they've already lost from the very beginning of our special military operation. That's what Putin calls it. And says, using the official uh, Russian term for the war, its beginning also means that the beginning of a radical breakdown of the American world order. He said, that war in Ukraine means that this is a sign that America is going down. Now, I don't believe everything Putin says, but when he says what the prophets say, I say he's right. Is he, does that mean that everything he's doing is right? No. Now, my brothers and sisters. This talks about the revolution. I don't want to go through this right now. Let's talk about the revolution. 
Now, this tells me then that if I understand this, I see the final piece. I see what's getting ready to happen before that final piece. I see the civil war coming. And then that tells me this. The thinking men told us this. And this says a radical theory, major crisis, remake America what? You remember we did that? We went from 1705. Remember that? What was the last or the fourth 80 year? It took us not from 1705, but it went through the American Revolution. It went through what? The Civil War. It went through World War II. And then the fourth, fourth turning takes us to what year? Talk to me, somebody. And what did they say would be the result of this? What should we expect to see inside of this last uh, 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 fourth turning? It says sometime before the year 2025, America will pass through a great gate in uh, history. Commensurate, uh, commensurate with the American what? And what else? And 20 emergence. In other words, in 2025, we're going to see things that look again like a civil war. Did the prophet tell us this? Now, what nations did the prophet say will be involved when you saw the civil war? What? Why am I interested in that? Not just population. The war in Ukraine brought into focus India, China, and Russia. Exact powers by name. And then it produced starvation. The war in Ukraine, Russia, produces the law, the, 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 the world, the 90% of the world's fertilizer. Russia produces the majority of the, and Ukraine of the world's wheat. Palladium is there in Russia. Now, you may not know what that is, but see, this, this battle is about resources. It had nothing to do with uh, what these two powers are talking about. The East and the West are doing the same thing, and just in different ways. Now, my brothers and my sisters, we better understand something. God told us that this time will come before us. This tells us the very thing that we will see this happening, and I love how this thing says it. He says, now, winter. Now, you know, if you study winter, winter sometimes can come early, or winter can come what? You know, even in our season, winter can come early and late, but guess what? Winter, no matter what, is going to come sometime. Now, my brothers and sisters, we better understand that's exactly what's happening now. We saw, it said, India, China, Russia, and the cities of America, thousands of men and women are dying of what? The money men, because they have the, not the, had the power to control the market, this means starvation to the poor classes and will result in a civil war just before the work of the most holy place finishes. Now, my brothers and sisters, this means something. Now, in the last fourth turning, guess what happens? Do you know that Ezekiel 8 tells us that in the last fourth turn, there is the passing of a national Sunday law? We're going to close on that. Now, brothers and sisters, we're going to close on that. Look at what it says. The U.S. is heading to a what? What year? This is 2022. This is where we are today. It's headed to another civil war. Now, look what it says. The rise of government that is neither fully democratic nor uh, 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 autocratic. Let me back that up. This says, people who, now not people who don't study. People who study the origins of what? Civil wars see indicators that the U.S. is on the brink of this conflict, Yale historian says. Now, people, you know, it's amazing. When a man's not talking about truth, he says, oh, Harvard, great school. Yale, great school. High Ivy League schools. Then he tells you 2025. 20, you say, you know what? They're not, they're not too good anyway. Experts on history. Now look what the man says. Yale history professor Timothy Snyder spoke with Insider about America's future. Snyder said factors like, and he talks about it. He said, but Snyder said he thinks it's even more likely that the U.S. could cease to what? Though the idea of another civil war in the near future seems what? Far-fetched to many what? People who study such conflicts might disagree. Timothy Snyder, a history professor at Yale University, says, he said, look, the people who don't know, they say, oh, that, that will never happen in America. He said, well, the people who know, the thinking, the wise, the, the ones who understand, the ones who look at facts and data and information, they know that in America, we're on the verge of a civil war that's going to become worldwide in scope, in nature. Inspiration says that the teachings that led to the French Revolution all will involve the world in a struggle similar to that which involves France, a worldwide revolution, my friends. Snyder, an expert, a what? Expert after expert after expert, and yet, 
we say we don't believe. The rise, an expert on the rise in authoritarianism discussed the future of America, during which he said he fears the U.S. might not survive if former President Donald Trump runs again in what? But we don't have to worry about it. He would never run again. Insider asked Snyder how he feels about people invoking the civil wars. First of all, I just want to say for the people who actually studied the origins of civil wars, not just in the U.S., but as a class of events, America doesn't look good right now. Are you understanding, yes or no? Now, my brothers and sisters, what's that first word? Expert predicts what? Potential U.S. civil war, fall of democracy. A political expert has made a horrifying prediction about the future of the U.S. with 2024 being the expert, 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 expert. Every field, political science, economy, anthropology, sociology, science, science. Everything. Now, my brothers and sisters, by 2025, all of it could collapse. By 2030, it says, and it goes on. I'm going to pass on this now. That's what all the men said. Let me pass and fast forward to the end. Now, look what this says. Now, this is the war in Ukraine. Ukra Ukrainian president, what's his name? Now, watch what he says. Watch what he says. Various Ukrainian cities, uh, cities he talks about being attacked. He talks about Russia has turned the Ukrainian sky into what? Source of death for thousands of people, Russian troops. Now listen to me. The Ukraine war happened on time. Watch. Russian troops have already uh, fired nearly 1,000 missiles, Ukraine countless bombs. They use drones to kill us with precision. This is a terror that Europe has not seen for Do you hear the bell on the priest? What does, it, what does he mean? So I read, I said, we were reading this, and I looked at it and I said, Lord. The war in Ukraine happened on all of the effects. One time, we're watching the beginning of the collapsing completely, and we're still wondering, should we study a little bit longer? What should we do with our families? It's time to make an exodus. And the greatest exodus is to exit this world system and to get back on God's system. This exodus to prepare us for a time when no man can buy or sell. This exit must take us out of the cities into God's outposts where we can finish the work. But the most important exit is the exit from self into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you understand me? Do you understand me? Now, my brothers and sisters, we're closing. Look, 80 years. What does that tell us? That history now tells us it's time. It's time. My brothers and sisters, the war in Ukraine was just like what happened. 2022 is, guess what? No ordinary year. It's happening. Will there be a World War III? This is what they said when they saw the war in Ukraine. They looked at all this and they saw it. Now, ah, I can't go through this. I'm gonna, oh. I got to look at this one. We were looking at these things and I was putting together all these different things. I had, I had article after article after article on Ukraine and Russia and we were talking about all. See, we've been talking about this long. Anybody who's been coming to these camp meetings, have we been talking about this years ago? Before 2020, if you've been at this camp meeting, didn't we tell you that in 2020 something was going to happen? Yes or no? Now, my brothers and sisters, I was looking at article, the article, now the article, and the article, and I saw it. I was putting it together and looking at it, and all of a sudden, a young minister, one of my sons, and the, he, he was a son of the prophets, <laughs> sent me an article. And I looked at that article. I said, yes, yes, yes. That's exactly what the article was saying. I, put, I, I just put it right there. I just put it right in my file, right beside the other article. I just laid that thing down. Look what it says now. India, China, Russia, and the what? What did you see? India, China, Russia. 
Ukraine brought all of them into existence. In the exact order. Prophet says, when you find where you are in history, everything will be fulfilled in its order. This is it. I don't care what anyone does. My brother and sisters, I want to be with my family. You know, in Exodus chapter 12, they said they were to put the blood pour, uh, on the doorposts and to keep the families inside. The Passover, the Exodus was a family event. And in that family event, the whole family, no, you know, can you imagine if, you, if the man said, you know what, your son said, you know what, I want to spend a night with one of the Egyptians tonight. I want to sleep over one of the Egyptians tonight. And you allowed them to go to the Egyptian house on that night, finish. Inspiration says, gather your children within your own homes. Teach them away from those who have disregarded the law of God. It says it's time to get ready to get out of the cities as fast as possible. In the future, the problem of buying and selling will be a very serious problem. But the most critical thing is this. When the sunny law passes, judgment will pass from the dead to the and if we are not back in that sinless condition, at the end of the day of atonement, we will be, guess what? Cut off. When God wants to make us his friend. I close by saying this, brothers and sisters. We see the gas. We see the oil. We see the food shortages. We see all this happen. I can't go through this now. We see the invasion, what it brought in. We see all the things that the experts say, that the food prices are getting higher and higher. Everything that God said would take place. We see the puzzle being put together. We see the final piece being put together. We see everything happening that's going to bring the world to a halt. We see all of it happening. We see it coming to an end. But my brothers and sisters, we'll talk about this another time. The end of all of this is going to follow the pattern of what? When the priest comes out of the sanctuary on the Day of Atonement. When the priest comes out of the sanctuary on the Day of Atonement. Guess what happens? This says. This says. The Savior's coming was foretold where? In Eden. From the days of Enoch, the promise was repeated through patriarchs and prophets, keeping alive the hope of his appearing, and yet he came not. The prophecy of Daniel revealed the time of his advent, but not all rightly interpreted the message. Century after century passed away. The voices of the prophets ceased. The hand of the oppressor or the slave master was what? Heavy upon Israel, and many were ready to exclaim, the days are prolonged and every vision faileth. But like the stars in the vast circuit of their appointed path, God's purpose is no, no haste and no. That means it happens on time. Through the symbols of the great darkness and the smoking furnace, God revealed that Abraham, the bondage of Israel in what? Talk to me, somebody in Egypt. And had declared the time of their sojourning should be 400 years. After he said, shall they come out with great substance against that word? All the power of Pharaoh's proud empire battled where? On the self same day, appointed in a divine promise, it what? You know that Israel left Egypt at the exact day that God promised, 400 years before. So, in heaven's council, the hour for the coming of Christ had been what? Determined. And when the great clock of time pointed to that hour, Jesus was, guess what? Talk to me. Born where? In Bethlehem. Jesus was born, guess what? On time. Jesus died, guess what? On time. Jesus resurrected, guess what? On time. Jesus went into the holy place, guess what? On time. Jesus went into the most holy place, October 22nd, 1844, on. And guess what? Jesus will come out of the most holy place on time. We're closing. Do you believe that the time has come, yes or no? In Leviticus 16, it says, who brings the goat? What was the name of the man who brought the goat? You know the man fit man me? I mean, he was exercising in the gym. That's what I used to think. But if you go to the Hebrew, you look at the original word itself. It comes from a word, iti. Go back and read it. 
Look for yourself. You don't have to wonder. Look for yourself. It means timely man. A man who comes on. So the fit man is going to bring the goat. Guess what? And guess when the prophet says the time is at the end of six thousand years. 6,000 on earth reaches the limit generation, the final generation. We go up to heaven for 1,000 years. God's going to finish the plan of redemption. In 7,000 years, he does everything in sevens. My brothers and sisters, if Jesus died on the cross in 31 AD, about 4,000 years of human history had gone off the scene. About how much time, about how much time would be left? About 2,000. If you add 2,000 to 31 AD, you're going to get what? Talk to me, somebody. 2031. But because we don't know the exact time that sin started, guess what it tells us? 2031. Guess what? Plus or minus. Not definite time, but the generation. That's what the wise men said. Same years. So where does 2025 come in? You see, 6,000 years takes us to when Jesus comes back the second time. But as Seventh-day Adventists, we don't have until 6,000 years. A little bit before 2031 plus or minus, a little bit before the 6,000, something's going to pass on this earth. What is that? It's going to pass. Talk to me, somebody. And so, Sunday law crisis, 2025 plus. Or minus. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, if you looked at a carton of milk and the expiration date said October 15, 2022, and you look at it and say, oh, well, what month are we in right now? We're in what? August. What day are we in right now? August what? Fifth. You say, well, I still have a few more months. And you open up the carton of milk. And you look inside and you see green fuzz. You smell the odor of spoiled. You see the color of discoloration. Do you say, well, the expiration date says a few more months? <laughs> Brothers and sisters, if we look just at the events. The event just before he leaves is civil war. The bell is sounding. Get ready, get ready, get ready. The bell, as the priest moved in the sanctuary, the bell. It doesn't even look like we have in the 2025. It will take a divine miracle. And I'm praying, Lord. You know what I'm really praying? You want me to be honest with you? I'm praying, Lord, work a divine miracle. Not because I want to stay here and, and continue in this world, but brothers and sisters, do you know we have not even begun really the exodus? Do you want to begin the exodus tonight? What is the greatest thing we can do to begin the exodus? Someone says, I know. I better get rid of all my sins because we must be sinless. Do we need to be sinless? Yes. Can we get rid of our sins by ourselves? Someone says, I know, get out of the city into the country. Do we need to get out of the city into the country? Yes, as fast as possible. But is it possible to get out of the city and still have sin? What is the greatest thing that we can do right now? The spirit and the bride. Somebody said, I can't come yet because I'm still playing with this sin. I'm, I'm still doing that. I, I can't come now because I got to. Jesus said, we can come just as we are. With all of our baggage. We know a God. Did you not hear this morning's morning matter? If you missed it, you would miss a lot. We serve a God that is bigger and greater than our sins. Where sin abound, grace does abound. No. Where sin abound, grace does what? Much more. You know the song, Grace? Amazing grace, God's grace. Grace that is what? Greater 
then all my sin, all of it, brothers and sisters, we need Jesus. And to develop a relationship with Jesus takes time. Friendship takes time, and time is running out. Do you want to start tonight to come to Jesus? You don't have to let anything go to come. You can come just like you are. To your family. Do you want to, do you want to say, Lord, now, now. I want to make an appeal. If you want to make an exodus to Jesus, I want you to get out of your seat and let's come forward and let's pray before we close. You say, Lord, I want to make an exodus. I want to run to Jesus. I want to find him. I want to know him. I want to be ready for the coming of the Lord. Oh, brothers and sisters, Jesus is coming. How beautiful it will be when he comes the second time and we can look up and say, Lo, this is our God. We waited for him. He's here to save us. I don't care what your sin is. I don't care what your problem is. I don't care what it is. My brothers and sisters, Jesus wants to save us. And no sin is too hard. No sin is too great. What can take away my sin? What? Talk to me, somebody. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. My friend, would you come here, please? Jesus is coming. I want to be ready. Are you happy you're here tonight? What's more important than this? Nothing. Keep coming here, please, please. Nothing is more important than this. It's time to surrender everything to Jesus. We're getting ready to pray right now. I want you to pray for a little while by yourself and just say, Lord, I come. Remember that song? Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. And since he bid me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I what? I come. I come. Pray that to God, and then I'm going to close this in prayer. We want to pray. Are you ready to pray? Let's join the Lord in prayer. Oh, Father in heaven, you're such a loving God, Lord. We don't deserve your love. We mess up so many times. We fall again and again. But there's going to come a time when we will fall for the last time. Either because we will stay down and be lost. Or we will grab the hand of Jesus and never fall again. Everyone will fall for the last time. Lord, I want to fall into your hands like David prayed. I want you to keep us from falling. And this happens through a relationship with Jesus who said, come just as we are. And that he has the cure for sin. Save us, Lord. Save our families. Thank you for what you did. We sense your presence here tonight, Lord. Thank you for showing up tonight. And it wasn't even midnight, Lord. The Passover was at midnight. But you cut it short so that you can reach our hearts. Help us to be a part of this team that you use, Lord, to finish this work. Thank you. Be with those who are watching on the Internet. And be with the person that I talked with earlier. That has a special work that they're to accomplish. Lord, tonight is the beginning of that work. Thank you.
Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. As we get ready to dismiss, when we leave tonight, we don't want to do much talking, amen? Tonight is a very solemn time. I would say tonight as we get ready to go back home, let's go with our families. Let's do what they did on the Passover. On the Passover, they put the blood, the blood on the doorpost. They gathered the families around them and they rededicated themselves. Let's do that with all of our families. I'm going to go back and do it with my family too. Into All the World, a Messengers of Light ministry presentation.